There's phytocannabinoids. They're called THC and CBD, tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidiol. This is, this is someone's license plate that was bold enough to actually advertise cannabis on their car. And I can tell you that the person's wife, when she first saw this, was not happy. <laughs> Uh, and, and then there's endogenous cannabinoids, right? Endocannabinoids. These are the ones in your body. Anandamide and glycerol. They're in there. We have them. We're using them now. You all are using your cannabinoid molecules, your endocannabinoids. And then there's synthetic cannabinoids. like Marinol and Sesame, which were produced, uh, I think, by Pfizer in the 80s and 90s. And, and Marinol is a synthetic uh, tetra uh, THC. Uh, Marinol uh, was, was created in the laboratory. It's a synthetic cannabinoid, but it binds uh, to the cannabinoid receptors in the brain. And it was approved by the FDA for use in uh, HIV uh, patients who had cachexia. They had AIDS wasting syndrome. They had terrible weight loss and anorexia. And by using Marinol, you could improve uh, appetite and uh, Im improve, or rather, try to reduce weight loss by giving those patients the munchies. And it worked. Uh, it was also approved by the FDA uh, for use in cancer chemotherapy patients who were nauseous from their chemotherapy. And the oncologists in the 90s were happy to have that tool. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work that well, and the patients preferred to smoke weed that they got on the black market. And they told their oncologists that their black market weed worked much better than the Marinol. And there were surveys done of oncologists in the 1990s and, and, and since then that reveals that the vast majority of physicians are okay with that. So why, do, why doesn't Marinol, the synthetic THC, work as well as God-given cannabis, because there's more to the story than just THC, right? There's CBD is in there, there's other molecules, there's terpenes in the cannabis plant. Those are the aromatic compounds, the aromatic molecules. We were talking a little earlier about um, aromatic therapy. And the smell of cannabis, believe it or not, has, has biological effects. You know, so that stinky joint that you smell at someone's enjoying at the concert. Just let's say that the aromatic compounds, which are called the terpenes in the cannabis plant, have biological effects. I'll give you an example. In, how much time do I have? Oh, oh. Yeah, this is an example. In Japan, there is a practice called forest bathing. Has anybody heard of this? Some, some of you may have heard of this, forest bathing. It turns out that going for a walk in the forest is very good for you. Now, this is something, of course, we know, but why is it good for you? And how good is it for you? Well, there have been studies um, that show that these forest bathing um, hikers that go through the forests in Japan um, have had lowering of their blood pressure and better regulation of their blood sugar. And it turns out that the molecule that's responsible for that is called pinene, P-I-N-E-N-E. P-I-N-E-N-E, pinene. Pinene is an aromatic compound that is in the air in forests. And pinene that's extracted and given to patients helps them with their, not only memory, but other homeostatic systems. What do you think of that? So I ordered some pining. I have it in my office in an, in an amortizer. And I, so yeah, I do. Oh, so there are some really bad synthetic cannabinoids out there. You guys may have heard about um, K2 and um, what's the other one? Spice. These are synthetic cannabinoids that are being sold to kids and I think at the corner drugstore you can buy these things and it makes them goofy, but it also turns them into what one newspaper headline referred to as zombies. And there was an outbreak in Washington, D.C. recently. Awful, terrible. So that's another example of a synthetic cannabinoid. Now, 
I just want to go back because I, I didn't mention this part here. This, this, this uh, image right here is a representation of the biological membranes in our body. You know, we, we have cells and, and the cells are surrounded by membranes. That keeps all the good stuff inside. And on the surface of the membranes are the receptors. And I mentioned that the cannabinoid molecules bind to receptors in order to evoke a biological response. That's how things work. So there's different receptors for different molecules. Um, and in the brain and body, we have CB1 and CB2 receptors. So suffice it to say that the CB1 and the CB2 receptors are distributed throughout the body, CB1 especially in the brain, and they bind the endogenous cannabinoids as well as the phytocannabinoids to evoke a biological response. So we have molecules, we have receptors, we got membranes. So here's an example of a neurotransmitter molecule that binds in the brain that you may be familiar with. Dopamine. Dopamine is, is, is like a superstar of neurotransmitters. It's not my favorite neurotransmitter, but it's, it, it's a good one. Well, it used to be serotonin, but now it's an andamide. I'm sorry. But dopamine's right up there. Uh, dopamine is important in um, a reward uh, mechanisms in the brain, and uh, you know it, it's released in certain parts of the brain uh, when patients or, or individuals use opium, for example, or have sex, and and that's one important thing that dopamine does. But it's also super important for control of movement, and patients with Parkinson's disease end up being stiff and slow and shake because they run out of dopamine. That's what Parkinson's disease is caused by, is a loss of dopamine in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra. The receptors for dopamine are up in a further, well, rostral part of the brain. And the receptors there in patients who have a lack of dopamine don't have anything to do, and those patients get stiff and slow. So, the, so there's dopamine receptors in the striatum. Dopamine is broken down, and if you don't have enough, you have Parkinson's disease. That's pretty clear, right? Same thing with serotonin. If you have a lack of serotonin, you might be depressed. If you have a lack of acetylcholine, you can have dementia. What happens if you have a lack of an andamide? an endogenous molecule that binds receptors. What happens? Well, we don't know yet, but there are theories. If you don't have enough of your own God-given endocannabinoid to bind those receptors in the brain, what kind of problems might you have? Well, we're still learning that. And I think that within the next 10 or 20 years, we're gonna know a lot more about what some have called endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. If you have a deficiency of endocannabinoids, you might have problems. You might have fibromyalgia, chronic migraine, mood disorders. We're learning more, and I'm going to show you some research studies. Okay. Five minutes? Oh, my God. Okay. All right. Endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. You started late. Thank you. Thank you. So the endocannabinoid receptors, if you do a study in the brain and you, and you look at the density of receptors in the brain and you look at how many dopamine receptors and serotonin and then the CB1 endocannabinoid receptors are, guess what? The CB1 endocannabinoid receptors are the most prevalent. What are they doing there? We, we don't really even know yet. They're also present in the gut and in the limbs. Endocannabinoid receptors. So we know that when you use cannabis, as a supplement to your own endocannabinoids, it helps, it helps the GI tract. In uh, the 19th century, uh, cholera was treated with cannabis very effectively. We use it now for Crohn's disease, it works great. So here's an example of a few conditions that we think represent a manifestation of endocannabinoid deficiency. Migraine, fibromyalgia, and possibly, possibly irritable bowel syndrome. How do we know if that's true or not? How do we know if that's real science? Well, we do experiments. 
In Italy, th these researchers studied patients with migraine compared to patients that did not have chronic migraine, and they did spinal taps on these people and, and took out the spinal fluid from their back that circulates the brain. They measured the level of an andamide. And the level of an andamide in the migraineurs was half the level of patients that did not suffer with chronic migraine. They had an antimite deficiency. So what happens if you give cannabis to patients with migraine? Well, this study here was done in Colorado in uh, patients in 120, actually this should be 121, in 121 patients with migraine, after they came in and reported having 10 migraines a month, they were put on a cannabis therapy regimen and their frequency of migraines dropped to half. Cannabis works for migraine. Maybe chronic migraineurs have an endocannabinoid deficiency. Patients with fibromyalgia, 1,300 patients were sent surveys and asked which medications work best for them. And it turns out that patients that were given duloxetine, and these are serotonergic uptake inhibitors and norepinephrine, these are standard uh, antidepressant therapies, and pregabalin is Lyrica. Patients that were taking standard antidepressant therapies and Lyrica did not have much of a response at all. This is the red bar indicating that the percent of patients were unhappy with their response. But this green bar showed, this green bar shows that fibromyalgia patients that were using cannabis were very happy. <laughs> they were happy. But why were they happy? They weren't having as much pain. Maybe their muscle inflammation was reduced. I mean, well, I think you get the idea. Because those studies are... Now, cannabis is good for other issues, and we in Florida have regulations in place to allow certified docs to provide cannabis therapy for patients with certain qualifying illnesses. And this is different from state to state. We now have 30 states in our union that allow cannabis therapy, and some are more restrictive than others. But in general, Here's a, a broad list of conditions that we know that cannabis helps. There's a bunch. And there's studies. A lot of the studies were done in Israel and in Italy and in Australia because of cannabis prohibition in the United States. The NIH was not allowed to really fund cannabis research in America. But the research is out there. You just have to find it. There's lots of conditions that cannabis is useful for. So this guy. Raphael Mashul, Dr. Mashul, and Rafi, everybody calls him Rafi. I don't call him Rafi, but I mean, people call him Rafi. He, uh, he's still working, and he created, he, he managed this um, study in elderly patients last year. Patients that came to his clinic, Tikhan Olam, which means heal the world, in Israel, the largest cannabis medical clinic in Israel. He studied uh, patients over a two year period to determine if, if cannabis was effective and safe in the elderly population. And I'm just saying, you guys are sort of like that, right? I'm just, I'm just saying. So after 2,700 patients were enrolled, 900 patients were available for their follow-up six-month visit. So what he did was he did questionnaires at day one and, and then questionnaires six months later. And unfortunately, the majority of these patients were using cannabis for cancer-associated pain, and so, you know, they, they, they passed away or, or they went on to different treatments. But 900 were taking cannabis at the beginning and at the end of a six-month period, and they constituted the study population. And these are the results. In terms of pain control, on a 10-point scale, where 10 is the most severe pain. Before treatment, which is a dark blue, it's a little hard to see here, before treatment with cannabis, the percent of patients, or rather the number of patients, was very high. So this, this is the number of patients with severe pain at the beginning. 
And after six months of cannabis therapy, this number of patients had super pain. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's science. science. Uh, they were also measured on a quality of life scale, and it shows that before treatment, most patients had very bad or bad quality of life. But in this lighter bar here, it shows that after six months of treatment, most patients reported a good quality of life. So this is a general quality of life scale. Hang on a second here. He's making it. And in the last uh, graph here, in, in getting the patient's overall condition after six months of care, the number of patients that reported slight, moderate, and significant improvement was very high. So, I mean, that's not a pun. I'm just saying. These, these patients improved. These patients improved. So, what are some of you wondering? Some of you that are, that are a little skeptical wondering. What are you wondering? What did, what did Lawrence Olivier tell Dustin Hoffman in The Marathon Man? Is it safe? That was a plant. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, this is a movie. Is it safe? Well, anyway, never mind. Doesn't it? That was 1976, I think. Okay, I'm almost done. Is it safe? Is cannabis safe? What are the side effects? Well, in, in, in Dr. Michelin's um, study, that last one I showed you, the most common side effects were dizziness, dry mouth, and somnolence. And this, these reported symptoms occurred in 9, 7, and 4% of patients at least once during that six month period. So they got on cannabis therapy. If they reported any episodes of dizziness, they were put into this um, adverse event profile. So yeah, so it turns out that you can get dizzy or have a dry mouth or feel tired from cannabis. Those are side, potential side effects. But fortunately, it did not occur in a large number of patients. We don't consider this a large number, 9%. And it's usually tolerable. And can, well, anyway, we'll get into more of that another time. So talking more about the risks of, of using cannabis, it can cause intoxication. If you use too much cannabis and you get high or stoned, you can't operate a motor vehicle or do your job. If you use it with opioids and alcohol, it could cause a problem. Um, there is something called cannabis use disorder, which usually occurs in teenagers who use heavily every day, and then they, um, they, they remove themselves from social interactions. They become amotivational, and uh, they don't feel as though they can function without cannabis. That's a cannabis use disorder. Does that happen in older patients with medical problems? Not really. It's basically a psychological dependence, not a physical dependence. And of course, there are medication interactions, for example, Coumadin, uh, Warfarin, and cannabis, and Fluconazole. There's some other medications that don't quite agree with cannabis, and that has to do with enzymes in the liver. And of course, there are legal aspects that, that limit cannabis uh, transport and use. And uh, I have a bunch of patients that are interested about their carry permits, too. So, nuts and bolts. You come to the office if you're interested. Give us a call, and uh, we will provide uh, education, more education. Uh, we will talk with you if you're interested or you know someone that might benefit from cannabis, for example, for anxiety or insomnia or pain, or epilepsy or Parkinson's or GI issues. You come to the office, you enjoy the experience. That's confidence, right? And then uh, we help you fill out the form. And then within two weeks, you get approved by the state, you go to the dispensary, and you get your cannabis medication. And then we continue to guide you with the dosing and proper use, whether or not it's vaping, or which is inhaling a vapor, or using capsules or tinctures. So in general, in, in conclusion rather, I, I just want to emphasize that cannabis has been around for a long, long time, and we're still learning so much more about it. Um, I believe, as others do, that cannabis will be the aspirin of the 21st century. Thank you. <laughs>